100 years ago, on the 2nd of February, 1922, James Joyce celebrated his 40th birthday at home in Paris, and his novel Ulysses was published. Joyce had spent eight years writing this book during extraordinary global times. Personally, his health was failing, and he was living in impoverished self-exile from Ireland, in Trieste, in Zurich, and in Paris. He had known literary success and failure. Now, in creating his modernist masterpiece, which would transform world literature, he would know infamy. It was banned, it was burned, it was blacklisted. Joyce was blackguarded and he blackguarded in return. Set on just one day in Dublin on the 16th of June, 1904, Ulysses as a text is celebrated around the world every year on that anniversary, Bloomsday. Today, as we celebrate the centenary of this phenomenal book's publication, I'm delighted to have four of Scotland's most passionate Joyceans here in the Scottish Storytelling Centre to go beyond the text, to discuss the very feat of publication of Ulysses. In dis discussing the context in which Joyce wrote, struggled, was published and was damned, we hope that you will be intrigued to return to the book or to pick it up for the first time and discover why this extraordinary text continue, continues to dominate literary debate the world over. I'm delighted to introduce our host and guests for this Ulysses 100 event. Brian Taylor has been well known to many for decades as Scotland's preeminent political broadcaster. Brian is a lifelong fan of James Joyce and has starred in international Bloomsday film projects. Dr. Maria Daniela Dick is lecturer in Irish and Scottish literature post-1900 at the University of Glasgow. Maria particularly focuses on international modernism and has published widely on James Joyce. Carla Jenkins is a journalist, author, lecturer and broadcaster. She has studied literature in both Scottish and Irish universities, having been a devotee of Joyce since her school days. Carla is also a student of the Trieste Joyce Summer School. Dr. Richard Barlow is an associate professor at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore and is also the academic director of the Trieste Joyce School. Widely published on Joyce, Richard has considered the Celtic links between Joyce and Scottish culture in his books. I'm looking forward to a lively discussion, putting the publication of Ulysses in context. I hope that you will be inspired by this discussion to pick up the book and read it afresh. Jane, thanks very much indeed. I'm a huge fan of Scottish literature, particularly Sir Walter Scott, all too often uh, neglected, uh, unfortunately, these days, but I think he's a great writer. But I am an enormous fan, an enormous fan of Irish literature. Here's a confession. I actually spent a portion of my honeymoon a few years ago now. It was in Dublin, and I spent a portion of that honeymoon um, uh, uh, taking my wife around the, the, the various sites connected with, with literature in, in, in Dublin, particularly Yeats, Swift, and very much James Joyce, searching for the real Davy Burns and all, and all that sort of thing. So I've been a terrific fan of the canon down the years. I, I've even brought with me a, a well-thumbed copy here of, of uh, Ulysses. It, it's not my original well-thumbed copy. There was an even better thumbed copy, but I, I, I lost that in celebrating a particularly splendid Bloomsday once. I won't go into the details of that, but I'm delighted to be joined by a, a, a really expert panel here today. We're going to try and keep it as as loose and light as, as, we, as we possibly can. But I think it's important to, to um, try and set in context, first of all, it is, we are talking about the centenary of the publication, um, which you go to, Maria, to, to tell us a little bit about the, 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 the centenary of the, of the publication. It's, you know, the, the circumstances in which it, it came about. And, and what, you know, presumably that centenary is well worth marking now, you would feel. Yes, I think um, it's it's more pertinent than ever that we mark it now. Um, if anything, just to to keep it even more uh, long lasting in, in the public memory. Uh -huh. um, and it was a book that had such a fight for its own publication in 1922. A fight to be born, yeah. It really did, yeah. And I think um, it was, you know, conceived against the backdrop of many wars, not only its, its own pub in between two wars, and it had yes. its own sort of fight to publish its own publication for itself. So I think it's so important that we uh, talk about 
talk about it today yeah and more importantly as well that we also talk about it in the way that we're going to um with a, a, a mixture of voices genders speaking on the subject and just making continuing to keep it as accessible as possible for the wider public yeah maria is it, it talk, tell us a bit more about this battle to be published i mean it was the difficulty of the content it was the difficulty of getting it published at all was it and sylvia beach a, a woman in paris played a huge role exactly well many women played a role yeah. actually in the publication of the book but joyce begins to write ulysses in um, 1914 and then he starts to serialise it in the little magazines okay. in 1918. So it so came out in bits. So it comes out in bits. Um, uh -huh. It comes out particularly in the Little Review, which was edited by two women, Margaret Anderson and Jane Heap. Mm -hmm. And then also um, it, it comes out uh, in the Egoist as well uh -huh. um, in 1919. So from nine, from yeah 1918 to 1920 we see the book um coming out in these well what would become the book coming out in these serial uh, little magazines okay in mean, the 18th and 19th century serialization of novels was absolutely standard wasn't it but, but, especially yeah. avant-garde writing as well ah, okay. so joyce would have been appearing in a completely different context than we know him now so he'd been appearing round about what we now know to be the modernist writers but at that point they were the modernist avant-garde so um, that was the context for the work as it was appearing and Joyce was writing the work as it was coming out. And there's a theory, Michael Grodin has a theory that it begins to become longer after it stops <laughs> being published in the little magazine <laughs> and you can write with more leisure. But effectively what happens is that um, he's always skirting um, issues, legal issues, because of the nature of the text, because of its frankness, because of its sexual intimacy, uh. because of its, its so-called obscenity, the uh. language that he uses. And um, so in 1920, um, the Nausicaa chapter comes out in serial and it most ends up being, all, yeah. exactly, the most controversial. It ends up being taken to court, Anderson and Heap are taken to court. Uh -huh. and, and that's pre-publication, so... That's pre-publication of the book, So yes. the actual full publication of the novel, there would have been a, a, a literary uh, a canon of people or section of people who were waiting for it, they wanted to eagerly anticipate it. Exactly, they, they, like a coterie of people, and it was known, the book was becoming known and the project was known about, um, but then it was effectively killed so dead because it couldn't be published in the US okay. or anywhere else after this. So Sylvia Beach steps in in Paris and she says, I'm going to publish it in she 1921. She was a, a, an American born an American, Paris bookseller, yeah, yeah. Exactly, and she owns Shakespeare and Company, which isn't only a bookshop, but it's also a kind of salon for this avant-garde writing. Shakespeare and Company, for the you lost love it. Generation. Oh, yeah. all, the, all, the, all the trendies would have been there, wouldn't they? <laughs> exactly. You could just see them. But, exactly. uh, uh, Richard, it's very, it's very, it's a European publication. It's a European setting, and yet it's very much an Irish book as well, isn't it? Tell us about that European context, if you would, for the, the writing and particularly the publication. Yeah, I mean, just to add on to what Maria was saying, um, there were great difficulties in getting the book published and Sylvia Beach steps in, um, Shakespeare and Company publish it. And just thinking about um, Joyce's life in Europe, particularly in Paris in the years yeah. coming up to 1922, I mean, he's constantly on the move. His health is very bad. Um, you know, he has problems with his eyes. He's constantly having attacks of iritis. His yeah. teeth are very bad. Um, I think in 1923, he has a lot of teeth extracted. And he yeah. seems to be just working himself into the ground, um, just a, a state of total exhaustion. Uh, he writes in one letter that he put, um, I think it was something like 20,000 hours of work into Ulysses. So there's the publication struggle and then there's just the human struggle as well. And just to um, come back to what you were saying about the centenary, about this um, you know, marking yes. 100 years since 1922, yes. uh, which is very important, but. I think we should also like, bear in mind the, the years just before and after. Um, you know, everybody talks about how the last word of Ulysses is yes, which is kind of true, but really the last word in Ulysses is 1921, but last word in inverted commas. And uh -huh. I think that really reminds us of the kind of the human struggle behind, um, behind the publication. But to, to talk about it as, a, as an Irish and European book, yeah. yeah, I mean, even right up into the last the last uh, months where he's revising and adding more and more material to this, he's still writing back to people, friends and relatives in Dublin, asking them about specific 
uh, details. You know, so he did his work, he did his research. It's not just splurged out on the page. He really did his work, really did his topic, yeah. Yeah, and this is something that got him into trouble because he wanted to use real, the names of real people, real businesses, but he wanted to have everything uh, just so, you know, like to make everything as accurate as possible. So it's very Irish, it's very specifically um, Dublin, I think, and yet it's, you know, he was really influenced by living years on the continent in, in places like Trieste, uh, Rome as well, but then uh, Zurich and Paris, and of course, those places are in the, the final line of Ulysses as well. Okay, let, let's let's uh, let's confront something. Let's confront something straightforwardly. The, the book is a difficult book. It's potentially um, a, a challenging book. Is it perversely difficult? I mean, I'll, I'll give you a quotation. It's Rosemary Goring, the Scots writer, writing in the Herald. She says, "James Joyce might scarcely be read today if he had not become a pillar of the English literature department." The argument she's she's putting is that. For love it like, like a challenge. It's like, you know, I don't know, like the hunting of the snark or something like that. It's, it's a challenge, a series of puns, tricks, word, word play. What, what, do you, what do you make of that, Carl? I mean, I, I don't agree with that final analysis, but I can see the, that some folk do like, oh, it's cool. He's a little, little, little uh, difficult bit that we can understand and others don't. It's a kind of a touch of elitism about it as well, perhaps. Well, in my experience... Let's dispel that, shall we? Yes, yeah, so let's yeah. dispel that. In my experience, it is a book that has difficult parts in it. But there are musical albums that will have songs that you don't quite like very much or you don't understand why they sound that way. Okay. And I firmly believe that while it has difficult parts, it's not an inaccessible text. Okay. And it's not too difficult. And it's not deliberately so. He's not. No, I, not, no. I really don't. I, no, don't, I, think don't, think so. So I don't think you could. Um, I don't think you could say that the, the first sort of episode where we meet Bloom is so difficult that you can't understand it. I think it's one of the most enjoyable texts that you can read yeah. because it's so flowing and natural. And I think that, you know, when I first read Ulysses, I was 20, 19, yeah. 20. I started studying it when I was 15. Uh -huh. And I sort of eased my way in with it. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. 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 It doesn't have to no, be I this agree. thing. I, that you, I, I, I do I think it's one of those that it has bragging rights. I mean, you're talking, you're talking, about, talking about Bloom, the story, the, the story of Leopold Bloom. You know, it's not some remote, distant tale. It's it's poignant. It, it's, it's empathetic. It's, the, it's this isolated sad figure trying to make his way around around the, the, the Dublin of 1904 uh, and of course all the, the, the difficulties that he confronts. It's a real genuine human story, isn't oh, it? Yeah. That's that yes. section and many others. Yeah. Yes, I mean I firmly believe and I've always said this but Ulysses is about the celebration of life and that's life oh, with like everything. It. It's an affirmation of life and life with everything in it. It has you know defecation, eating, having sex, having sex with yourself, you know it is, it's one of those things that doesn't shy away from anything no. but it also has going to the butchers, going to do a bit of work, going to see someone put a bet on you know it has everything in it and it's it ends in an affirmation so that's that's to me what Ulysses is and that's of course accessible to everyone I think. Are there some academics Maria that do delight in in the complexity and, and enjoy it or or, or or do you do you agree that it is an accessible tool? To, yeah to I well? fundamentally I agree and I agree with you as well Brian I think it's probably an unfair assessment because or even an unfair binary because even in the so-called academy now there's a real trend towards this idea of thinking of Ulysses in exactly the way that Carla has just explained it. You know, to think of it as a book that teaches us lessons about life, teaches us lessons about ourselves. So that idea of a very humanist book, of a very humane book, I think is certainly one that is popular now. And I think even within Joyce's own canon, it's not the most difficult book, probably. <laughs> yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. Against Finnegan's Wake, when yeah. we're thinking about that. Please. You've read Finnegan's Wake, I take it, yeah? I have. I'll well hate you say that they've read well Finnegan's Wake. What does it mean? I <laughs> 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 looked at the words on the page. Yeah. Richard, what's your, your take on this? It, it, it's, is, do you regard it as an accessible book? You, you, how do you regard it in, in that context? Is you know parts of it are, are, are difficult? They're almost there's difficult puns. There's the stream of consciousness writing. There's the famous soliloquy by by Molly Bloom, which I've been pretty, actually pretty straightforward. But there, yeah. there, there are there are some difficult hurdles in in some ways. But you know our, our friends here believe those can easily be overcome. Yeah, they can. And like when I teach Ulysses, I always say to my students, but nobody understands all of this. Um, certainly not on a first reading, but that doesn't mean you can't enjoy it. I would, I, I totally agree with what Carla and Maria are saying that it is really accessible. 
On the other hand, there are parts of it that are puzzles and enigmas and riddles, and there's pleasure to be gained from working those it's, things out as well. Is, if you yeah. want to, you know, if you want to, you can just leave the, the art, but so is life. Uh -huh. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll watch you briefly. Just say that last bit again, please. Uh, McDermott said that Ulysses is difficult, but so is life. Oh, I <laughs> like it, like it, like it, like it. That's that's not a bad, not a bad description. I mean, the the, the the there are there are sections though. There are art, there, there, yeah. there, there are sections that are that are challenging. But you you believe we should see it in a different way. Some people have said to me, if you read it out loud. Yes, well, do you know, interestingly, that's how Marilyn Monroe read it. She said she loved the sound of it, and she would keep a copy of the of the book in her car. And she would read it, um, you know, in between trips, meeting and things. She, uh, honestly, Wonderful. she, yeah. And there's a, a fantastic picture of her in a park reading it. But there's and there's posters and all sorts of things that have, have been made at this picture. And there's some I think which have been edited to show her reading it upside down, um, which is which is frankly quite insulting. Uh, 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 yeah, but that, that would that would be that would be staged, wouldn't it? Yeah, that would be just yes, a, of course, because she, she yeah. really loved it and she read it outside. Uh, 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 sorry, she read it. Um, out loud and she said it was the, the shape of the words in her mouth that she loved ah. rolling the, the words out and around her tongue and it was really quite a sensory experience which I'm sure a lot of people would describe experiences with Marilyn Monroe as the same but she loved it for that reason. But there is wordplay isn't there, there are puns, that the, he's, he's, in some parts especially in, in Finnegan's Way but in Ulysses as well he's toying with us a bit as well isn't he, he's toying with us, trying us out, you know, what do you think of that, what do you think of the taste of that, you know like the taste of the words. Is... Exactly, I think trying out for himself as well because it's such an experimental book and um, what Edge of Pink was the shock of the new, uh -huh. I think even now when we encounter this book you can, we can see that and I'm sure to readers of the day that would have been even more the case. That's interesting, the shock of the new. So you, you're saying that a century on, it is very much, we're not just looking at a, an, an historical event a hundred years ago, we are looking at something that has impact even today. Exactly, and I think that idea of the event is a good way of thinking about that book. You know, it's an event when you come to it, explode yeah. like an event when you read it. And yeah, so the style of it is not even consistent, as you said, um, Brian, it changes, doesn't it? We have music in it, we have catechism, we have um, like the penny novel, like the romance novel. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, and, and there's rich characterization and there's tremendous warmth and, and you, you talked about you know the the, the, the the eating the food, the gorging, the guts, yeah. the, there's a real Dublin life in there isn't yeah. there? Very much so, yeah. Yeah it's definitely a novel of the everyday, it's a novel uh -huh. of our, our life from, from morning to night, literally yeah. a novel of one day but one also day, a novel yeah. of the everyday, the quotidian. The, 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 uh, let me give you one quote, I'm going to come to Richard with this as well in a second. T.S. Eliot, you mentioned Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, writing in 1922, Wasteland just about to be published, he, uh, he was de defending Ulysses against its, its critics in an essay, Ulysses, author and myth, he said, and again, I don't agree with this one, but he said, the next generation is responsible for its own soul. A man of genius, he's including Joyce in that, of course, is responsible to his peers, not to a studio full of uneducated and undisciplined coxcombs. Gone yourself, T. S. Eliot. That's that's <laughs> that, that's the way to make the public love the book, isn't it? You're all a bunch of uneducated, undisciplined <laughs> cooks. Yeah, yeah, not, not, not helpful, is it? And, and I don't think right as well, you know. But Eliot was so interested in this novel because he was trying to do something similar in the Wasteland, which of course is published in the same year, yes. 1922. And he famously says that Joyce has discovered the mythic method, which now people really take to be more of a pronouncement on Eliot's own work uh -huh. than it so was the, actually the, about Joyce. Mythic being what, using a classical base? Classical, a classical structure. Yeah, the, the story of, of Ulysses Odyssey. being, yeah. yeah exactly, okay, yeah, uh -huh. which Joyce did do, but in a, you know, there are questions over how loose that actually was, how much he meant that to be taken um, seriously or alongside. What, what, what do you make of that, Richard, the, 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 the classical nature of, of, of the narrative? It's still a story of Dublin life, isn't it? Yeah, and I agree with uh, Maria there. I think um, that essay, that Elliot essay, is really Elliot talking about his own work. And he's kind <sighs> of misunderstood. I think he's misunderstood what Joyce is doing there because, you know, Elliot is saying that he's providing an order for like an anarchic world. But Joyce yeah. is frequently reminding us in Ulysses and in Finnegan's Wake that really there is no progress as such. Um, things keep on repeating. There are resemblances across time, repetitions, parallels. This is a huge part of what Ulysses is about. And I don't think that Joyce ever thought there was order in life. Um, and he's not trying to find order in Ulysses, I think. And from also, what you've described, there was little order in his own life at the time. His well, own life was like, Exactly. Like if, 
there's a part in Elman's biography where it says that if somebody pointed out some awful atrocity happening in the world, Joyce would point to some equal, equally awful atrocity, you know, in ancient times, as if to say, you know, nothing ever really changes, okay. Okay. Um, which is not the Eliot's way of looking at things, or and it's not then um, Walter Scott's way of looking at things. To come back to um, no. uh, a writer you mentioned earlier, you know that that things get better, there's gradual progress um, from one phase of history to another. I think um, Joyce doesn't agree with that. Joyce says that actually the essential things in life don't really change. Uh, people don't really change. I, I, I don't want to obsess about Scott, although I, I, I certainly could. But, you know, he's, he's regarded as being, as being posh and, and, and toffy. His best novel, in my view, is The Heart of Midlothian. It, it is about a working class uh, uh, Scots woman who is defending her, her, her sister against the charge of infanticide. It's written, a lot of the dialogue is written in, 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 in Scots language and yet Scott is seen as this 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 toff that we wrote about Bosch gets it's not it's not true it's it wasn't true then and it isn't true now and and end of message let's get back back to James Joyce <laughs> let, let's talk about let, let, let's let's talk about Ireland let's talk about uh, Ireland because it is it is I think we've agreed it is a European book it is a global book but it is very much I think part of the Irish canon and yet Joyce was how should we be polite? Ambivalent towards towards Ireland at the time. He he didn't live there. He lived as as Richard has reminded us in in Trieste, in Paris, in in, in Zurich, and in, in in other places. He lived in Rome. Uh, he he didn't live in Ireland, and yet he didn't write about anything else. No, you know he he had his own self imposed exile. But I personally believe sometimes I wonder how much of that was processing trauma he went through while without going to um, you know therapist styled okay. on it. I wonder, you know, sometimes I feel that like he had to leave Ireland to understand his life there. And he, he was obsessed with the place, you know, uh, as I mentioned, he, he you know, used uh, Tom's directory to make sure that he knew every street, knew who was living on the street, so that it was accurate in the book. And uh, there's the, the quote that if Dublin burned down a day, you could rebuild it from, from the pages of Ulysses. Now, uh. some would say there's quite a few discrepancies in that. But I, I do believe that with Joyce uh, writing about Ireland, he left the place, but his mind and heart that you know were always there. His uh -huh. heart was in Dublin. And yeah, you could be cheeky about Ireland oh, as well. Yeah. Like, you know, insolent. Yeah, about of it. course. Yeah. But I mean, you can be cheeky about lots of things that you love, and aye, I do yeah. feel that him writing about it, it's because it's what he knew best. But he had to leave to be, to enable himself to do that. I think to to as he as he as he said, you know, leave the shackles of the place and. Um, you know the church and and the politics of it. He had to be free of that to write about it and to understand his own thoughts on it. And I think the the product of that understanding is what we have as Ulysses, is how people are portrayed in it, how people walk about the city, how people live their lives there. That is Joyce's Dublin. That's the the Dublin. And if you it. read the Dublin of Ulysses, you uh -huh. would see it as a warm, living, variegated place. You wouldn't see it as as if it's been written from. No. Hundreds of years, of, uh, hundreds of, of, of miles away, and, and and years distant in thought. You, you don't yes. you don't see it that way. No, totally. And he, you know, I, I wrote um, when I was at uni. I wrote my dissertation on his his eyesight and his lack of eyesight, oh, his failing wow. eyesight. And I think Declan Kyberg writes about that as well. I'm not comparing myself to him at all, or his works uh, to what I did. But you know, the more that his physical ability to see in front of him really was uh, it went inward, and he wrote what he knew from his his mind and I think well, the job the Dublin that we see is a warm place is a difficult place is a uh -huh. hard and cruel place uh -huh. but that is the place that Joyce has in his mind's eye it's Dublin from the interior of Joyce it's the closest we'll get to what he really thought of the place R Richard what, what, what do you make of that you know he's a, a European writer but, but an Irish writer yeah both I mean he clearly uh, felt to some extent part of an Irish tradition I think but um, like Carlo was saying, I think he felt stifled to some extent. He felt betrayed. Um, he didn't want betrayed. to live under. Yeah, well, he was constantly feeling betrayed by basically everyone in his life um, and looking out yeah. for betrayal and, and so on. And he, I think yeah, he his, his to... family, his, his, his father, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, also thinking that Nora had possibly betrayed him, which doesn't seem to be true. No. But also to be, to be free of what he called the two masters of Ireland at that time, he wanted to be free from. But I think his attitude softens over time. I mean, if you look at Dubliners, um, there's a lot. It's kind of the work of an angry young man. There's a, a slight yeah. bitterness in parts of Dubliners. But then he realizes that by the time he comes to write The Dead, and that's much more about the hospitality of Dublin and uh -huh. conviviality, that sort of thing. And I think you see that more in, in, in Ulysses as well. 
it's, there's not so much anger. There's more of a sense of understanding of uh, kind of empathy towards the people living there as well. But you have Joyce and Ireland definitely been reconciled, you know, a, a, a century on. I think so. I think so. I think Joyce was recognised as a European writer within that context because he had to be, as Caroline Richard has said, he was in exile alongside many of the other modernist writers in self-exile. Um, so that became the way that his work yeah. was received because it was happening in Europe. But also... That's, that's a fair point. We, we don't question Fitzgerald as, a, as, a, as a, an American writer, or, and yet he was quite definitely writing in, 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 in Paris and, and other parts of Europe as well. Indeed, he? and Hemingway. And Hemingway they, were, well. they were all involved in Shakespeare and Company as well. So I think that he is definitely both. There must have been some party, eh? Fitzgerald, Hemingway and Joyce. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, but yes, I think, um, also as Richard said earlier, he was obsessed with recreating the detail of Dublin. He collected ephemera to help him do that and he wrote to people about things like transport timetables, like oh very, very detailed um, <laughs> To see whether the peregrinations of, of Bloom and Daedalus are, are possible, are physically exactly. possible. Yeah, that's really interesting. You know that, it's really exactly. interesting. Yeah. But he also, I think, writes his, um, his attitudes towards Irish literature or the Irish literary tradition that he saw himself both coming in but also diverging from into Ulysses. So he famously in Finnegan's Wake calls the Celtic Twilight the Cultic Toilet. <laughs> Perhaps ironically. Um, but we see there the kind of divergence, I suppose, of Joyce's vision for Ireland um, and what he saw to be a regressive vision of perhaps of Yeats who he was um, who he had varying attitudes towards That's really over interesting. The years. We, we, we had a mention of McDermott earlier, and writing about the same time, McDermott was deliberately breaking from the, you know, the kill yard of, yeah. of, of, of the turn of the century in, in Scotland, and also deliberately trying to get authentic buns. You know, skip the plowman poet. The guy was an was a extremely well read, um, um, uh, intelligent uh, uh, you know, you know, polymath, really, rather than that. So he was trying to get. Do you think Joyce is trying to do that, get an authentic view of, 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 of real Ireland, and, and, yeah, exactly. but while still being in the canon of of Swift and, and, and Yeats as well. Exactly, but his question, I suppose, was what is authentic? Because okay. this the idea of going to the West, um, as Yeats or Lady Gregory are saying, did to you know to extract folk tales or yeah. oral um, tradition was not the way that Joyce was going to go. He saw okay. it as being a, a progressive. This idea of a dream modern, of Ireland. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. exactly. He saw that as being, um, I think, retrogressive. R Richard, I saw you nodding at, at, at that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, I agree with uh, what Maria is saying, but having said all that, he was still interested in the Celtic world. Uh, this is something that I've uh, been interested in for years. And he makes bizarre statements, like saying things like uh, Hume is a Celtic philosopher and there's such a thing as Celtic philosophy. And even in Finnegan's Wake, he's interested in Celtic languages. Um, you know, the main figure behind that is Finn McCool. Um, so... He's not a Celticist in the way that Yeats is, but he's doing something, he's still interested in the Celtic world and in doing something kind of different with it. Let's talk about the, the Ireland of the time, the Ireland of 22, of course, a rather remarkable year in Irish history. Ulysses set in 1904, so we can't expect him to be writing particularly about that. What, what, are, there, are there touches in the book of, of the Ireland of the, of the early 20th century, particularly the, the, the Ireland of, of the lead up to... The free state? Yes, I think, of course, there's going to be touches of that because he was writing at a time where it almost foreshadowing. He did, you know, he, his choice to make his sort of main character, I should say, with Bloom being a Jewish man, is outside of all that. So he's yes. allowed to have that sort of from the outside looking in perspective. And that's quite deliberate. Like, that's quite well, deliberate. Yes, yeah. I would yeah. say so. I'm quite like he he is from the outside writing in almost, you know, writing from, from where he is, not, not in. Ireland or, or even in Dublin but you know when he's saying things like you know jo Bloom being Jewish from the outside Joyce does he meets characters of course that are going to have as you see the citizen you know uh -huh. there are of course moments of politicized speak politicization. It says, like a, it says it has a fight with Bloom in a bar but that was also espousing Venian yes, views. Yeah. yeah well I mean and there's the anti-semitic element of yes. that as well however I think that it's important for Joyce not to be sucked into that because his book isn't about that. It's not about the politics of Ireland. It's, it's not, not a political about, biography no, of the time, I, I although think, there are references to, I think it's Parnell and, and Yes, and, and oh, others. of course, all yeah. through it. Because that's, 
that is the context in which it's written in, but I don't think that... And Joyce is himself, you know, staunchly apolitical okay. in terms of the war. You know, people say, well, I fought in the war, what did you do? He said, I wrote Ulysses. So what was your <laughs> contribution to the war? I wrote Ulysses. I wrote Ulysses you know? yeah. and, and that was his position on it. And I think a lot of the people who were attracted to it, you know, Sylvia Beach herself as well, again, it's, it's not, for them, it's not about the politics all the time. We okay. can read it politically, but that wasn't his primary concern. I don't Maria, we don't get a picture of political Ireland in, in the start of the century, do we? We, 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 just, we just don't. We, we get hints of it. We get, it's there in, in the background, but it's, it's yeah. not. And I think, as you say, he chooses to situate it in 1904 there and yeah. some questions over why he does that. It's also the year when he meets Nora Barnacle, so it's ah. an important year in Joyce's life, um, an important anniversary. But yes, certainly the events that were contemporaneous with his writing of the novel don't feature in the novel um, because it concerns the recent past. It's a, a novel of recent history, if you like. But then, in some ways, it's the, the very, very first post-colonial novel because, because it comes out weeks after the founding of the free states, the Irish free states, and yet it's about the colonial situation. So Expand on that for me, that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. so in the sense of when it was published literally on the 2nd of February, oh. the Irish free state has just come into being. So in that sense, we could say it's historically post-colonial. There are obviously, okay. you know, ironies abounding there, but um, but he doesn't go deeply into that, does he, as a, as a writer? But you, you say he's, he's aware of it. I think he's interested in the colonial position through voice, particularly through Stephen Dedalus and Portrait of the Artist and in uh, Ulysses. That's and and Dedalus' is little doubt, both in Ulysses and Portrait of the Artist, is, is Joyce, the, the, the little, is it? Certainly, I think he's been ventriloquizing ideas okay. of Joyce, yeah. He's a, a kind of figure of Joyce, okay, yeah, I okay. think so. R Richard, what's your take on this? I mean, how, how much is Joyce writing about the island of the time and how much is he writing about you know, the island that he remembers, the elements of Ireland that, that he, he, he uh, recalls. Uh, I'd say a few things about that. I mean, I'd say he's a very, very political writer. Uh, um, it's certainly in the, the Cyclops episode. I mean, yeah, he's talking about sort of late 19th, early 20th century Dublin. But even though it's anachronistic in the world of the novel, which is set in 1904, there's still parts where it seems like he's talking about contemporary events in Europe and in Ireland. Yeah. Um, and also just to add on to what Maria is saying, I mean, um, not long after the Free State comes into being, uh, Nora takes the children to Ireland against Joyce's wishes. And, uh -huh. um, they're caught up in the fighting between the um, IRA and Free State, Free State troops in Galway, uh -huh. which is Joyce is horrified uh, by. But just to say one other thing, that the Ireland of the Free State and the Civil War is really present in Finnegan's Wake. I mean, uh, he's writing that in the periods of, you know, the, the free states established, the De Valera years, and also the kind of, um, the Ireland's like post-Civil War, that's very strongly there in Finnegan's Wake, which is all about sort of a divided kind of terrain. Tell, tell me how Joyce has seen on, on the, the European, you know, in, in Paris, in, in Trieste, where there is, of course, a, a, a strong connection. Is he seen as, as, a, as a, a European great? In Trieste. In, um, in Trieste and Paris, yeah. in, 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 in European, you know, uh, academia generally. Yeah, I think so. I mean, he's just seen as the, uh, one of the giants of modernism and in European literature more generally. I mean, it's really in Ireland that, I, that initially, I think there were ah. certain people who were very interested. There were certain people who were slightly resentful. Um, but it took a while for Joyce to be established as an Irish writer, which sounds crazy, but he was oh, yeah. initially seen as a sort of uh, European, cosmopolitan, almost like a Parisian writer, perhaps, and less, oh. less as an Irish writer. And it's only been, I think, in the last two or three decades where people have really put his work into a specifically you know, Irish political and cultural context. And you think it's there now firmly? There's no question about oh, that. Yeah, now. for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I think... Joyce's work is unthinkable without, you know, the Ireland of like the late 19th, early 20th century, you know, the revival, the movement towards independence, like it's so important for understanding Joyce's work. In, and in and he wasn't remote from that. You're saying he was quite, in, in, he was fairly aware, if it's not particularly firmly there in, in, in Ulysses, it is in the later writings, yeah. He was just, after a certain point, just very careful about making, uh, you know, statements, oh. political statements. 
but it's there in the work. I mean, I'm not saying that the work has a, spe a specific position politically or anything like that. No, it it's, doesn't. But, but the the issues are there for sure. Carlo, the book was was in a way it, it wasn't hugely popular initially because it, it couldn't be sold. Oh, it, it, you know, yes, the small exactly. matter of it couldn't be distributed for for fear of the law. Yes. But but those who bought it. Loved it, didn't yes, they? Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I do find it really interesting that you know it was actually never banned in Ireland, but there was a loophole that stopped it being kind of um, circulated there. And it was uh. not until about 1960 that you weren't really able to get a copy in Ireland of Ulysses, which I think is pretty amazing to think you could, a place that is so, it reeks of Ireland, you know, you can't uh -huh. actually, you couldn't read a copy until 1960. But of course, I mean, if you have, if you at that time managed to get your hands on a copy, you'd manage to bypass the post office, burning the copies as they found them, bypass the censors, and you have it. I mean, that must have felt completely revolutionary and almost, you know, a bit of, I, I think, just to hold that. But, and to but know does that, does that, that, that gets back to this business of the, the elite and, and, you know, is, is it a, a good work in its own right? You know, were people reading it because it was, it was the, the, the joy of defying the state or, or were they reading it with appreciation because it's a, you know, a yeah. damn fine novel? Well, I mean, they could have been reading it for both those for reasons both. or for yeah. one, but the point is that they were reading it and, they, and, and yeah. it was not an, it was not an, a non-political statement to have a copy even if you are reading it or not the fact you have that you're making a statement that you have that and i think regardless of what was the political context of that time in times in terms of the publication history of the book there is a political context to that because it's about freedom of speech and and censorship and being able to write and create art and that i think is one of the, the lasting legacies of ulysses you know regardless of the actual innards and content of the book the fact the book still exists and we're talking about that here uh -huh. is because people fought for that to happen in 1922. maria yeah yeah, yeah. completely uh, agree uh, two seconds richard yeah maria please yeah yeah, um, richard, yeah. yeah i think it's is a brave book in that sense because it wasn't joyce's first go round with the censors he'd had problems from dubliners yeah. on yeah. and um it did, it had a small readership by necessity because Sylvia Beach only published initially a thousand copies wow. on the 2nd of February and it was by subscription so you had to subscribe and it was sent out to you and then there was a second pub, well a second printing yeah. um, facilitated by Harry H. Shaw Weaver in the October of that year, 2000. Um, so again, not a huge amount, and mm. of those 500 were lost, they were burned. Yeah. Um, and the ones that ended up circulating after that, they were disguised or yeah. or um, separated up into... Brown paper um, covers exactly, and things, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. things like that, um, disguised as other Sounds books. Sounds a bit like the Velvet Underground, they only sold a few thousand copies, but everybody who, who, who heard it formed a band. Oh, well, right, <laughs> that was a cut <laughs> hit in that sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in, in a way, it was a book that, yes, had a reputation that was... Mm by association or second hand because a lot of people, most people had not Have you read, read it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It had, had a cult following from the minute it was conceived, before it was conceived. But it, you, it was, what, was it a genuine following for the value of the book or was it because it was yeah, uh, suppressed? Well, I mean, I think considering it did, I mean, Virginia will famously like, poo pooed it at Aye. first and I think um, it, the fact that it had it had a, a following that, which, which enjoyed the book so much, who enjoyed the book so okay. much that these sort of, uh, uh, you know, receptions didn't matter, it endured. Okay, Rich, Richard, you were keen to come in. It was just to come back to something you said there about elitism. And one of the reasons I love Joyce and Ulysses is that it's not like some other or many other modernist texts, which are very elitist and have sometimes a hatred of the working class, sometimes anti-Semitism. Joyce uh -huh. isn't ever like that, and that's one of the great oh, things. About like, that. No, no. like you could say that there's an elitism in Ulysses in terms of the difficulty of it. We mentioned that earlier, but there's uh, a really empathetic um, yes, kind of yes. vision of life, which a, a lot of modernist texts don't have. They just have a, a kind of a hatred of the mob or the masses, that kind of thing. Ulysses doesn't have that, and that's one of the reasons uh -huh. it's such a great book, I think. He's, would, would you like to have a pint with him, whether in Davy Burns or anywhere else? Yeah? <laughs> who, who, Joyce or Bloom? Uh, jo Joyce, jo oh, Bloom, oh. Joyce and Bloom, you know, the, the two of them together. Get, 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 oh, man. Get it's probably more fun to have a pint with Bloom than Joyce, but... Yeah, <laughs> You argue with you, you probably end up buying the round as well. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but but, but Maria, why, why do we still celebrate a hundred years on? It was, it was, it, it, it's, it's a, it's got a glorious history. It's got well, an inglorious opening history, and then a glorious history since. Is it still worth commemorating a hundred years on? Is it still an important book to commemorate a hundred a century on? I think for its literary value, yes, it's 
remains an important book and will always, as Richard said, be an important book. Um, I think that in terms of its popularity as a book, whether people have read it or not, even its popularity is what we might think of as a kind of cultural artefact in the sort of imaginary of Ireland. It's even more popular now than it was, um, you know, maybe 50 years ago or even 20 years ago. We only have to look at the programme of events around about the centenary to see that. And there's a real endeavour, isn't there, to make it make it more accessible, that stands of it being driven forward, but to, to enable it to be more, more accessible. That, that's a real ongoing discussion in, in academia, in, in, in you know, governmental circles, and etc. But there's a real uh, uh, attempt to, to enable people to, to access the book again. I think so. I mean, yes, as an object, we have to have access to it. People need to be able to, to read it freely and to have access to read it. But I think that probably it's a false dichotomy to start from the point of view that it's not in and of itself already accessible and um, that perhaps that sets up barriers for people to read it that wouldn't otherwise be there so um, my advice would be to, to plunge in, to take an, a watery metaphor from Finnegan's Wake and maybe to do what Carla said and start from um, the Calypso episode, start, for, start at chapter 4 and then go back because that's a very good episode to uh -huh. start at. Yeah, totally. I think as well, if you haven't read uh, a portrait before to start off with Stephen, I who's a really quite a tricky character in himself. And I Steve, been, Stephen Dedalus, yeah. Yes, yeah, so yeah, I think okay. he's quite, oh, I just, I'm just like. He's a bit of a pain sometimes, yeah, isn't he? Yeah, calm down, <laughs> yeah. take a chill pill, have, <laughs> have a, you know, take a leaf out of Bloom's book and go for a drink with him, you know, uh, calm uh, down a bit. But I think. Um, it's interesting Have what you said. Some gorgonzola. Yes, go get a cheese sandwich. I think as well what you're saying is, is it about the are we how what's our responsibility to make the book more accessible? The book's not going to change. It's the dialogue and the discussion around it that does change. And I think we're moving more into a time where we can acknowledge and appreciate. Joyce was a genius, of course he was, but Joyce was uh, was enabled by so many people around. And we're talking about the publication. I think it's really important to mention Sylvia Beach, Harriet uh -huh. Weaver, Nora, the woman, um, the woman who uh, published the um, the little review. You know, the people who helped him, and look at them as well and see the role they played, and perhaps revise the previous associations we may have with them with Nora you know things like that I think she's been revolutionized now yes. as a person she's been sort of reimagined or, or rediscovered and yes. I think that where we are now and he, talking, couldn't, he couldn't have been an easy man to, to no he sounds like a nightmare <laughs> I, I, I love his writing but I would hate to have been Nora because uh, she was long suffering and long enduring and loved the man so much didn't uh, she? she she loved the man so much and that's how we have Joyce because we have Nora I fully believe we have Ulysses because he had Nora. So she enabled it, and we can now enable the, 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 the work still for others. Yes, to be totally, yeah. Richard, I saw you smiling at that reference to, to, to Nora, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think she was long suffering for sure. She had to put up with a lot. And so did, so did his brother, Stanislaus, but Carla's yeah. right for sure to point to the role of many women who are instrumental in making this the book possible. And often did so you know without any great thanks from Joyce you know as people supporting him financially supporting him practically as well and he had basically had a team of researchers working for him so of course Joyce is the great genius but he had a lot of helpers as well and it's great to see them acknowledged for sure and that, that's that's a wee portrait of the man himself behind you there is that, uh, it is, that is yeah. one of many in this room but that's the only one ah, you can see just now very good very very good but let's let's talk about where you place it um uh, in, in Marie in, in the canon of, of world literature we it's a, it's a century on from publication it is it is a revered book by by many perhaps not 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 enough but a revered book by many where do you place it in as, a, as an Irish book a European book uh, a work of literature in the canon of, of, of world literature so I think it has to be right up there it's, okay. you know it's um, certainly I'm not going to put a number on it I, or be drawn into that. I don't want to offend anyone. Top three, top ten. No, 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 no. <laughs> these other books. Um, but I think the the term world literature is the instructive one because it is certainly a work of global literature, and it's been increasingly regarded within that perspective, within the perspective of not only a global modernism but a world literature, um, for various reasons. But I think even within Joyce's own canon, you said something really interesting earlier, Carla, that in some ways his works 
um, move into each other. They're not discreet um, That's true. in and of themselves. Yes. It's helpful to have read the portrait of, of the oh, artist's young man before you read. Yes, yeah. I would start with Dubliners. Work your way in. Double okay. Yeah, because okay. those because those characters, uh, you know, they reappear in the season. There's a real joy in that. You know, my favourite thing is working at the mystery of Emily Sinico and why Bloom went to her funeral and had a pocket, had a thing in his pocket, reminding her of that, uh -huh. reminding her of that. But I had I had said he was like the modern day Taylor Swift because oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> <laughs> because he has so many Easter eggs. You know, he said I've got things that will keep the critics interested for years, and she Taylor Swift is in her canon of work. You, you'll have to help me with the Taylor Swift side of things. <laughs> I've read well, Ulysses, but I'm, I'm, I believe she's a. <laughs> does she lead a popular beat combo? No, I'm not going to be as dull as that. But she, she's <laughs> an incredible musical artist okay. and really one of And writes the, her own songs, oh, despite yeah, the oh, accusation yes, that yes, came the other day. Yes. I, I, I did, did see that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, she does. She writes all her own songs. And so, she, what do you mean? That she, she has little mysteries in her? Yeah, like Easter eggs. She, she lays, she lays, not lays, lays traps, but she'll give hints in her lyrics to readers for about other songs okay. that she's written, other okay. situations in her life. And does Joyce not do that? You know, does he not? Not leave little Easter eggs for us. There's a character we saw in Dubliners, you know, even Stephen Daedalus. To start it off, you yeah. would be almost, if you started from the first page of Ulysses, you could be fooled into thinking this is just a continuation of a portrait of the artist. You know, he's saying at the end of it, old father, old artificer, you know, Sammy Ever in, in good stead. And then he's the start of it, he's back in Dublin. You know, he's going to go and, you know, and you could fill yourself into thinking if you didn't know, and I don't believe that anyone starts Ulysses without a prior knowledge of what Ulysses is about. Uh -huh. But you know, to open that front page and be con confronted with the fact that you had, you know, where's Bloom, where's this character you thought you were going to have, you don't yeah. have that. Yeah, yeah. It's a book which has so many surprises in it and so yeah. many Easter eggs and trails to follow and red yeah. headings and you get your mother and you yelling about your fearful Jesuit and then, and, then, <laughs> and then it's off into something else entirely. Yes, yeah, totally, yeah. 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 Yeah, you, you should do a PhD on that. Yeah. <laughs> Joyce, and, Joyce Taylor Swift. and Taylor Swift. A fair and good trust. I mean, I can imagine that would. You get an arts me. council grant for that. You know, <laughs> you a few years ago, you got Chase, but now you get an arts council grant. I'd probably but, have to <laughs> Richard, where do you place Joyce in the, the canon of of? We, we've been talking with you, particularly about the European context, European context, world literary context, the continuing importance of the work a century on from publication. Yeah, well, one of the great things about Ulysses, I think, is that. Um, in order to understand it, you have to understand a lot of other things. And when I was an undergraduate student, I wasn't the most uh, hard hard working. I didn't read all the stuff I should have read. And then I discovered Ulysses, and I loved it actually in uh, Trieste when I was an Erasmus student. Oh and I wow! Realized, oh, well, well yeah. here, where else? You know, you know, oh, I study it in yeah. Trieste, don't you know? Very good. Can't catch you with the carry on. Halcyon days. Um, and then, so I realized if I'm going to, I want to understand this book, but in order to understand it, I'm going to have to go back and read Shakespeare. I'm going to have to read, you know, Homer. Not that you, you don't have to, but it really helps you understand it. Um, you, and yeah. also it kind of gives you an education onto European culture because it includes, contains so much, so many references to European philosophy, uh, poetry, Great. novels, all sorts of things. But in terms of ranking, um, Maria was uh, reluctant to do that. I will do it. I'll say it's the second best book ever written after Finnegan's Wake. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Maria. Oh, yeah, a challenge has been thrown <laughs> down. I'm still not going to read no, on Richard, right, but um, yeah, no, I completely agree with him. But it's still influential. It, it is genuinely influential. Yes. It's it's not seen as a as an archaic, uh, uh, you know, piece no, of the no, past. No, I think it, it's, it's the book that people think they have to read, whether they're students or they're academics or they're not in the academy they're you know for everybody Ulysses I think is the one that people can say I'm going to read it I haven't read it yet I've got it on my shelf and I've tried it 20 times everybody has a relationship to it I think in in that way and I think what Richard was saying about it being an education I think that's right it's in some ways it's a very kind of autodidactic book it teaches you things yeah. about other things it's and Joyce was like yeah. that himself like yeah. Joyce Joyce yes he was educated he went to university at a time when a lot of people didn't but still Joyce was in some sense he was very autodidactic he liked to learn things he taught himself about a lot of things and to Robert Burns yeah. and to Robert Burns and a lot of that magpie knowledge finds its way into your poet, rubbish. Anyway, never mind that. But final question to, to each of you. Um, Irish literature is now hugely regarded, globally famous, globally regarded, without any, any question at all, uh, uh, both modern literature and, and the canon of past literature. What 
part Joyce, although, although disregarded at the time and, and, and published in, in Ireland at the time, what part does Joyce play, particularly with that, that year of 1922, in, 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 if you like, driving forward that appreciation of, of Irish literature? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Maria, then, then Certainly come. central. Um, I think for me it would be Joyce, Yeats, Beckett within that yes. modernist canon and spanning as well from the, the end of the 19th century to into the 20th century. Yeah. So Joyce for me would be a cornerstone of that and I think for most people. Uh, even even now and, and, and looking back at the relevance at the time that he encourage others to, to, I to think write. Especially now because in some ways he was not received as he is now back in 1922. I think uh -huh. his popularity has only grown. His, this, our sense of his significance has grown. R R Richard, w w w the, the contribution to the, the huge standing of, of Irish literature? Yeah, I mean, it's incredible really to think that for quite a small country, they produced such an amazing um, you know, outcrop of literature in, in the 20th so, so. century. I mean, to add to the names uh, um, Maria mentioned, they also had Lady Gregory, of course, she Missini. It's just incredible what Ireland produced in the 20th century. Um, but I, I don't know, I, maybe for Irish writers, Joyce might be a kind of blessing and a curse because yes you can learn so much from him but on the other hand he casts such a large shadow you know that and I think some writers want to kind of escape from that and I think Beckett even though of course Beckett and Joyce were friends and a lot of Beckett's early work is very Joycean eventually he realizes he can't do that or he doesn't want to to, to carry on in that direction and that's partly why you know he goes in in the in the direction of like minimalism to to get escape from that kind of Joycean uh, attempt to contain so much of the world, so you know, to go in a different direction. So I think a lot of Irish writers have to deal with him one way or the other. You know? So that and you reckon that presents a conundrum as as well as a, yeah. an advantage and a challenge. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's just such a huge figure now that he has to be engaged with one. Yeah, you have to make a decision or whether whether to sort of learn from him. Or to kind of actively kind of abandon him, or he has to be wrestled with in some way. Carla, it's not just a historical reflection. It's not just a comparison with with with, with Taylor Swift. I'm, I must go and listen to some of our songs. Right? <laughs> I should go straight from here. I'll give you a top ten. Oh, give me a, give me a top, ten, top ten. It's not just that, is it? It's no. not just historical. It's not just no, I, a, 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 an, an, an artifact from the past. Totally, it, it, no. It's not. It's not. It's not something to left in the in the past. I think it informs a lot of the future. You know, when I think of writers like Sally Rooney, um, you know, and her stylistic choices to leave out quotation marks, things like her writing about, about people walking around Dublin, characters in Dublin, you know, thinking um, your, uh, your oh, McBride, McBride, yes, mm -hmm. who wrote A Girl is a Half-Form uh, half Thing, and she really does, you know, she openly says, I am a massive fan of Joyce and he has informed all my works, whereas you'll have writers like Sally Rooney, who I think would probably say, Mm, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm influenced him, but I think you okay. cannot escape the influence of Joyce. Well, that, that point that Rich is making, this gigantic, uh, you know, in the, not quite a shadow, but this gigantic <laughs> yes. uh, uh, looming presence yes. the whole time. Yeah, it must be hard to uh, stand out the shadow, but I think a lot of female authors feel that I was Sally Rooney, a lot of people like Megan Nolan, things yeah. like that who are very contemporary, are being told, I can't stop being compared to people like Sally Rooney, then you get Sally Rooney who's now being compared to James Joyce. Uh, uh, but you can't escape it, I don't think uh, you can, and I don't think you should try. Uh, <laughs> You should just say this. We have, and especially yeah. in Ireland, I'm so jealous that uh, Irish writers now have such incredible literary forefathers. That you know, and we have that in Scotland. But to it's, have it's like to being say, a Jacobean dramatist and having, <laughs> having, having that paste Shakespeare coming yeah. on. You know, I know, but it's got another hit. Oh I, no! I mean, you know. Imagine having that to inform I've your. Fly a bungie or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, having that to inform uh, the work that you're writing and thinking, you know, I've come from this line of like, this literary tradition. You know, talking about Eliot, things like that. You know. He cannot be left in the past. He must be brought into the future. And I think pat on our backs for doing so and making him accessible to others nowadays. Oh, a pat on the collective back. Uh, th <laughs> thanks very much indeed for, 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 for tuning into this. Uh, th thanks to all the participants. That was a great discussion. I really thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm off to uh, reread reread Ulysses and, and have a have a dip into Taylor Swift as well. From me, Taylor, <laughs> to the new.